Um, hi everyone, uh, my name is Carrie Lyle and I'll be uh, chairing this wonderful panel today. Uh, I'm Editor-in-Chief of Dean Magazine, which is the world's leading magazine for lesbians and bi women and queer and non-binary folk too. Um, I'm delighted to be here at Homotopia, thanks to, to Sharon and to everyone for having me. Um, and I'm delighted to be joined by a wonderful panel of artists, creatives and writers. Um, I'd like to introduce you on the far end. This is uh, Niven Govenden, whose latest book, The Brutal House, is set in the heart of the 1980s New York drag ball scene and explores notions of parenthood, belonging, and inclusion. Um, beside Niven, we have Nilu, uh, who is, Nilu Sharifi, who is a poet, writer, editor, and videographer, who recently created Arrival City, an exhibition looking at immigration in the L8 area of Liverpool, held at FACT. Uh, we are also joined by Travis Alabanda, who is an artist, performer and writer and one of the UK's most significant voices on trans rights. And we are also joined by uh, Tammy Reynolds, who performs under the moniker Midget Bardot, who is part of the team behind Liverpool's queer cabaret extravaganza Eat Me and Preach. And last but not least, Tina, who will be our sign language interpreter for the day. Um, we're here to talk about art at the intersections. Um, so first of all, I'd like to ask our panel to talk a little bit about themselves and their experiences and the kinds of art they create. Um, Niven, can we start with you? Yes, yeah, sure. Hi, everyone. Um, what do you want? How? What do you want me to say? Every day. Start from the beginning. It yeah. feels like a sort of therapy. So I write <laughs> novels. So I write novels. Um, so you know, fiction is kind of my sphere, and this brutal house is my fifth book. And it's a novel about, um, it's set against a Vogue ball scene in New York. Um, and it's about a queer protest about a group of house mothers who started the legendary Vogue house. It's set in present day, and it sort of goes back and forth in time. And the mothers basically start a silent protest where they sit on the steps of City Hall with all the children from the Vogue houses around them. And they decide to start this protest to draw the city's attention to the disappearances of um, queer children from their houses over the years, which the city, in its civic, political, parental capacity, has not addressed in any way. And they've tried to um, bring the city's attention to this in various ways over the years, through political lobbying, through rioting, um, voting, all kinds of stuff. Um, and because none of that works, they, they realise that a silent protest to sit outside City Hall en masse to show a city, a community's level of um, trauma and determination to find answers is kind of what they will give them what they want. And I was really motivated to write this book um, very much because I wanted to write a protest novel about um, POC lives. And I write the book, it's split in, so it's a novel of voices, so it's split into various sort of um, narrative arcs. The main narrative arc is the mothers meeting their protests, but I don't name the mothers. It's written in a collective voice, so I write as a we, and I'm doing it to sort of um, fictionalise a unrecorded social history. And that was very much kind of my motivation for doing the book. Thank you. Neil, thank you. Uh, I guess I'll talk about Arrival City. Um, I I was asked to curate a local response to this German um, exhibition about these cities, these futuristic cities made up of um, migrants, like with the populations of more immigrants than not. Um, but when I was looking at Liverpool, I felt like it wasn't really comparable to the Canadian and German cities that the arrival city um, idea was based on because those cities have come about in the last like 20 to 30 years, even like some of them like 10 years, whereas Liverpool has been a city of immigration for hundreds of years. Um, and that means that that history is part of the architecture um, it's, and it's, there's now a whole generation of people or generations of people who are descended from a story of immigration but are now just scouts as well. So I, 
I felt like there was a lot of things going on because there's there's a you know refugees still come to Liverpool and people moving for all sorts of reasons. The thing I felt most about it was that immigrants are not a group of people. We don't have anything in common necessarily. There's so many reasons for moving from one country to another and that reason can be as individual as a person is and the individual circumstances of a person's life. So for me, the, the one thing I didn't want to do was make overarching claims about an identity because I don't think an Im immigrant is an identity in any meaningful or practical sense. Um, so it was about trying to, like, I, I made five films and I tried to represent um, or ask for the, for the input of as many different types of people as possible. Um, I tried to look at the history and how that impacts people who are scouts and black and um, tried to look at more recent um, history, like how that feeds into LA's relationship with the city and um, how people in that area have been treated by the police and the government over the last 20, 30 years and how that informs people's present day lives. But then also the people who are just completely new to Liverpool and have their own uni, like some people might love it here, hate it here. Like I just, I, w I, I felt like the most important thing we can, I, I could try and do um, would be to silence myself as much as possible and attend to the reality of how complex things are. And uh, I guess that that's the one, uh, the, the most important thing I took through the process of making those films um, and everything else kind of came from there and wasn't really planned. Um, that, that's like the, the approach to diversity that I like. Um, yeah, <laughs> thank you. Uh, hi, um, my name is Francis Alabanza, and I'm, I just have to name that I'm really distracted by the view. Uh, so if at any point you're distracted as well, I give you permission whilst I'm talking just to look at the view <laughs> as well, because uh, maybe like by the time it gets down the line, that will give you enough uh, of the view to then look at everyone else throughout. Um, it's just so pretty, sorry. Um, um, yeah, I guess my approach to like art and intersections or in my work is that I don't really think about it too much because I think just where I'm creating from and the point that I'm creating from means that naturally it will fall within intersections. I think that if I start to analyse my work from like a point of an intersection, then maybe the work becomes stale and uh, like over thought out. Um, I always think that I was like starting to make performance. Uh, I've always been making performance and writing and stuff. And then suddenly, like somewhere like three or four years ago, people started like then talking about what the work was and all these new words to describe it, like intersections or intersectional, or which isn't a new word, but people was, as always, when white people start using it, it suddenly becomes new. Uh, but uh, like people suddenly were calling it this or talking about the lens that the work was coming through. And I think I'd never really thought about it through that way. I was just making what I make, uh, which I guess has been about archiving what it means to be black uh, and gender non-conforming and trans, particularly in the UK. And I guess the reason that I say particularly in the UK is not because I'm in my work, I'm not interested in the global struggle of trans and gender non-conforming people, but I was finding that a lot of the archived language and words were having to go to the States particularly to use it. I felt like a lot of the language, the histories, the people that we were referencing around black transness, about, about black trans culture particularly, we were going to the States and kind of importing a language structure that I believe doesn't work here. Um, as someone that's family is living in the States and from the States, I think that we're racialized differently here and I think that blackness is working differently here, our history of blackness is different here. So I started to want to make work that was archiving a particular experience about being black uh, and or trans and gender non-conforming here. Um, I guess my recent show that was doing that was Burgers, uh, that uh, came here last year for Homotopia, just finished Edinburgh Fringe Run and is now on a UK tour. And uh, Burgers is looking at the moment that someone threw a burger at me in broad daylight whilst calling me a transphobic slur. And then uh, I turned it into a cooking show 
uh, where I invite a white cis straight man from the audience every night to cook a burger with me and we chat about shit. <laughs> Oh God! <laughs> Wait, <laughs> Thank you. Um, my name is Tammy Reynolds. I uh, am a producer and a performer. Um, in terms of intersectionality, kind of echoing what Travis said, it's something I haven't always thought about in terms of informing my work. Um, but what I do, what I'm passionate about, my focus is with being intersectional, I suppose, is the nature of being queer and disabled, and it's something that I find increasingly uh, more problematic, I suppose, in queer spaces and in the queer community, because so much of it is, uh, I just think there's an insane amount of ableism in the queer community, and, um, and it's specifically by queer people, not like there's ableism anywhere, they're spoiled but specifically queer ableism. And so I guess a lot of my work has started looking into how you can queer access and how you can queer the nature of being disabled instead of and making it and using it in a kind of performative way as well as just existing. Um, and so my work that I do in Liverpool mostly is with a cabaret night called Eat Me and Preach. And we kind of aim to um, present art that is intersectional and always talking about different aspects of queerness and not just a gay, cis, man, drag queen kind of thing, which is the majority of what people think queer art is. And um, we're very interested in challenging how to make things accessible and um, taking the party out of the basement and into the actual accessible venue. And, um, we have uh, people who are designated access angels who are, we dress up in very nice and make them look pretty. And you can go over to them if you're feeling overwhelmed or anxious or feel like you're going to have a panic attack whilst the show is on because the nature of the show is loud and overwhelming and radical and celebratory. And that's kind of the whole point of it. But it comes at a cost and it makes us aware of the fact that there are a lot of quiet queers and there are a lot of queer people who aren't in that room. And that's absolutely fine, they don't have to be. And, but we, I, we're, we're, when we're working to kind of really make sure that they can be if they want to be. Um, we have quiet spaces, we have just, we, I, do, I do the training with the balances and security to make sure they don't touch people and to make sure that if someone needs the accessible toilet, they are asked why. Um, and so I guess a lot of my experience I was talking to my friend recently about this, about intersectionality and stuff, and I was saying how like a lot of my queer friends get kind of annoyed at me because I am angry about a lot of queer issues and things like that, but I am angrier about disabled issues. And uh, my friend said to me, that's because you don't have the privilege of being able to care that much just about your queerness, because there's a bigger thing that is in your face all the time. So uh, people aren't seeing you as, disabled and queer, they just seem to use disabled. And that's why it pisses you off all. And so when I started thinking in that way, I guess that really informed my practice and my and where to place my rage and how to use it. Um, so I've started looking into distancing away from just cabaret things and making events and groups and things like that that are quieter and accessible and uh, reaching people who can't, who haven't been able to be reached before, basically. Because, yeah, the queer, looking at the history of queerness, um, it's all in basements and it's all in squats and it's all in these kinds of inaccessible, physically inaccessible, but also emotionally and um, mentally inaccessible spaces. And as beautiful as those places are, there's just a whole group of people who haven't been included. And so many disabled people um, don't identify as trans or don't, like, don't come out as trans or gay or queer because they don't even feel like they can think about it. Like they're not even given that privilege to be able to go, oh, I have a sexual interest in this, oh, and that kind of, like, they don't. And I think that it's partly 
because of the nature of queerness having to be boxed in and hide away, that that's happened. And so I'm working towards making it more accessible. Yeah, I keep saying that word, but it's the best one. Um, yeah, thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Um, thinking um, about today's panel, before the event, uh, thinking about inclusivity and what that means, I kept coming back to uh, e exclusion um, and how uh, often a lot of the inclusive spaces we see have come from that, that experience and, and from what that felt like and, and from what that did to us. And, and it sounds from all of your stories there that, that that's something that you've really experienced too. Um, if we could talk a little bit about inclusion and exclusion then, how how do you talk a little bit about your experiences and how that sort of spurred you on to create the space and to create the art? Um, you know, was that a, a space that somebody gave you or was it something that you that you fought for? Um, what what that looked like? Um, Tammy, do you want to start? Yeah, go on. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, I think, yes, okay. Um, I've faced a lot of... Oh, rude. <laughs> 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 um, I thought about my impression. Just, like, so I, Jesus. Um, so I, <laughs> yeah, I guess um, it's a tricky one because when you talked about uh, someone giving you the space or did you fight for it, I kind of find it hard to know the difference sometimes because I think that I, I feel like I've been in a position where I've seen it as someone giving it to me, when actually I probably fought. And so, um, the first time I experienced, I think, the thing is, is that you don't realize you're being excluded for a very long time. And it's when you see something that you realize you can be part of, uh, or meet someone who has had the same experience as you, and you thought that was just you having it. And so I guess, um, the first moment I really felt like I was um, actually doing what I wanted to really do um, and feel involved and included was probably when... Probably the first time I performed at Eat Me, I'd say. Um, I had a lot of performance opportunities before then at uni and they were very informative of like, what I do now. But I think I was... Um, kind of doing them for the sake of, because, because of them, but of me. Um, it's all I kind of had. And then when I first did drag for the first time as um, Brigitte Bardot, um, <clears throat> using a slur as my name was incredibly empowering. And having people uh, be uncomfortable with that word, and they kept calling me Michelle because I didn't want to say midget. It's like, I'm telling you, <laughs> that's my name. And um, and doing and a, a performance I did was uh, guzzling a load of red wine, like waterboarding myself with red wine, and then having like and to the song all by myself, and then having midget porn in the background. And that I still am not sure what I was trying to say. <laughs> it was sick. <sinned. laughs> <laughs> but yeah, and and so and that. I felt like the first time I had this rage and anger and I had somewhere to put it and I did something actually good with it and um, it made me want to think, it made me think that's not the first time they've seen a midget or a disabled person on stage doing something about the fact that they're disabled and that's something that people need to just see more of or other disabled people need to be able to do, especially queer disabled people and so that was kind of the moment where I realised how long I've been in that I and other disabled people, queer people, have been excluded. And when I did that, I was like, ah, this is what it was like on the inside, kind of thing. Yeah. You got a mic? Yeah, well, the mic's just between our legs. I'm just waiting. <laughs> okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. There you go. You had a wee. Um, exclusion? I don't know. Um, exclusion? formed how I saw myself for so many years. Um, when you're a child and you're excluded, the only way to make sense of that experience is to 
see yourself from the perspective of those who are excluding you because it's so much more painful to accept that you don't deserve it and that it's it's bullshit. Um, so you form a, a vision of yourself through the eyes of the people who don't want you. And um, it took me a long time to realise that and I'm still in a process of realising that every day. It's like when Kylie Jenner said that 2016 was the year of realising things, she was right. And it's been the same every year since. Um, so I'm constantly realising things. And what I'm currently realising is that, like, the, the idea that I'm this, like, different person, I don't want or need to carry that around with me. Like, I, I, I hear what you're saying about rage. Tell me what rage has, I feel now that rage has spared me on for too long mm. because what I find myself battling and involved with this figure that <coughs> fundamentally has never wanted me and like I want myself, you know, like I like me. Um, like people talk about imposter syndrome but I think that that puts the onus on the individual to to um, experience their exclusion differently but like it, it's not my problem that other people can't make space for me so at this point I'm I'm actually really taking a step back from most of the things I'm doing and I'm just trying to breathe and, and ex isolate myself from the demands of anxiety and, and stress that, that is placed upon us by other people like they, you're asked to be stressed, you're asked to be concerned about what, you know what I mean? I have to care about whether I do well or whether I'm included because I'm constantly being told by all these different messages, you know, um, heteronormative ones, capitalistic ones, that this is the way I have to de define myself. Like, I accept that as a woman of colour, as a queer person, as a gender non-conforming person, like that that's part of my experience and that links me to other people in the sense that we experience that aspect of life in a similar way but apart from that I, I, I'm tired of the idea that I'm supposed to have something in common with somebody because we share an identity because fundamentally that's never been me you know what I mean that's been other people's ideas of me like when I look in the mirror what I'm seeing is concepts that have been created by a whale but what's inside is immutable and like that's what I'm trying to get at because you know I have a personality outside of other people's um notions of me and I might have friends that I have plenty of identity characteristics in common with um but there's you know I mean there's plenty of Iranians I've got nothing in common with there's plenty of gay people I've got nothing in common with there's plenty of whoever that I've got nothing in common with and, and like there's individuals that I have nothing in common with in terms of identity but who I relate to in ways that no one else can understand so like I think that conversations and events like this are important but for me inclusion comes when we stop talking about it and when it's just a practice I, I think talking about it needs to happen but then the takeaway is to go in, in your own life see how you can silently create space for others through an act of humility. Like people talk about empowerment, but they don't talk about the disempowerment that we actually require other people to undergo to give us that space. Like you need to give something up for me to be here and for me to feel comfortable. And oftentimes we talk about gatekeepers as if there's like a guy there with like a book and he like <laughs> looks and sees if, if your name is there and you're not on the list. It's not like that. It's, it's like, can I stand to be in your presence? Like, do you make me feel so inhuman that I just have to leave? That 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 is more powerful excluded than anything else. Like, just uh, like allyship. People talk about allyship. The, the allyship that helps is the one that's silent and that I don't notice because I'm just so free to be myself and feeling so not judged and feeling like you see me as an individual and not any of these characteristics. I'm like. Yeah, I've got something to say to this world and, and the evils that are in it, but I'm trying to live somewhere else that is purer and which is like 
more human, I guess. And that, I, I don't really know what my work is going to be because I feel like nothing I've done so far has been representative of that. But like, that's the that's the hollowness I'm trying to sus- suspend myself in so that new things might enter it. Yeah. Laser. <laughs> Just, just end there. I mean, you, you said it all. I suppose, I mean, in terms of like inclusion, exclusion, like, so writing is such a singular process. So, by its nature, it is totally you, you need exclusion to write, and you need that as a starting point. Um, you know, I've been publishing books now for over 15 years. So when my first book came out, you know, we weren't, we weren't having discussions like this. And I was very much conscious of being, you know, the only ground person in the room, you know, with my publishing and stuff. Um, but in a lot of ways, that can work to your advantage because, you know, I, my first book was published by me literally sending a couple of chapters of a book I'd written to a couple of editors. And it was really cocky and I was really full of myself. And I was like, you want to publish this book? And I, the, this editor who got this manuscript on his desk by just chance, I don't even know how, um, loved the letter, I think, in a lot of ways more than the book, and he was desperate to meet me. We had lunch, and I said, I want to leave this lunch with a deal. He said, what do you want? Do you want to finish the book and come back to me, or do you want to talk to deal? I said, no, I want a deal today. So literally, we had lunch, we had a deal. Um, and I was really aware that the way to kind of be visible in publishing was really just to be true to your kind of ideas and the force of your personality, because actually publishers respond, you know, they're reactionary and they respond to what comes from you. And if you are driving a book through the force of your ideas and your personality, then that takes over everything else. And therefore, you can sort of sidestep those notions of exclusion and inclusion. So, you know, for me, that kind of really worked for me. And also, I was really cocky, and I, you know, I've always really believed in my work, and I was really... Um, kind of confrontational and really, really hands on with my publisher. You know, I come from a, a music industry background, so I was really used to kind of working with artists and stuff. So I wasn't going to be one of those writers who's going to hand over my work and let someone market it and position it in a certain way. So everything sort of came from my cues, and I found that really empowering. And that's sort of one of the things that I really sort of impressed to, you know, friends who have come up and people who were trying to write down and stuff is just to be really selfish and really singular in kind of what you want because actually the more I write the more I publish I'm really conscious of being sort of um, you know sort of trying to create a body of work that's my my thing that's all I'm really bothered about is trying to create a body of work and to be visible to other writers you know everywhere that you know if you can that I'm still in the room then encourage other people to be in the room as well I guess where do you think that um Confidence, cockiness, self-assuredness. Where do you think that came from? Is it something that you always had? Yeah. Well, I mean, I believe. I mean, I knew I was going to write from a really young age. I was always really sure of my work. So it, it, it comes from that, I guess. Yeah. Travis, is I've that been something? in the Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> wow. It's um, only to like ten minutes before uh, Star Science gets brought up on the queer panel. <laughs> <laughs> um, is that that confidence? Is that something you? No, I'm faking it up until this moment right now. (laughs) Yeah, I think uh, uh, the biggest misconception, I I have to do a lot to to get any kind of confidence to come between things. Uh, I have a very strict, like, personal routine to make sure that I can get in front of people every day, really. So, yeah, I can't relate. I'm I'm constantly... I don't know, I'm constantly doubting a lot of myself, more than I would like to. It wastes so much time. It wastes so much time. So, yeah. What have been the... Um, barriers or challenges that you faced in in creating your your art and, and, and in performing. I mean, luckily there's a in conversation with me tomorrow, <laughs> so we've got a bit of time there. And, uh, well. Yeah, if you want a full answer on that one. Um, yeah, I'm still actually really still reading from your, what you were saying. I just want to note that as well. Uh, I think sometimes in panels you're like, I'm trying to be more present too. And I think a person would have like been like this and gone on to the next, but I'm like, you're so right that like I'm not bonding or connecting with you right now because you're a person of colour reasons. I'm bonding with you because you made a Kylie Jenner 
fucking quiet and like <laughs> everyone can actually speak to what you say. Uh, so yeah, I just want to say I really appreciate what you're saying. Um, I think that for me, uh, I'm still facing barriers, right? So it's hard to like kind of look back on barriers I have faced whilst at the moment in particular as well, like I'm transitioning in lots of ways in my life. Uh, but one of the transitions I'm having at the moment is like from no longer being considered emerging to then finding the, 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 the platform that I'm meant to have emerged out of the sea, like I'm some kind of mermaid. Instead it feels like they've like pushed me off the emerging cliff and I'm just falling. Uh, and I feel like I'm really noticing barriers more than I've ever noticed in my a very short artistic career, but an artistic career. Um, I think that people, I can look back and retroactively see the barriers I faced before, but I think I had this, not confidence, but uh, lack of awareness about the arts, because I never planned to be in the arts, because I never planned to make theatre, because I didn't know that I was writing. Like, there's no artists in my family, I didn't go to the theatre, I just made work, and then all these artists called me an artist. And so for the first four years of everyone calling me an artist, I actually never called myself an artist, because I was like, I'm not a wanker. <laughs> um, so, like, I didn't really do any of that. And so any of these barriers that I can now look back on and see that I was facing, uh, I didn't know and feel it at the time, so it would feel weird to comment on them now. But right now, I'm very clearly facing barriers, and I think... Uh, I don't know how I get through them yet because I'm still working through them, but uh, when now I've got, unfortunately, more awareness of the industry, more awareness of its fucked upness, uh, I'm seeing what it means to have your work, uh, I'm seeing what it means to have your work copied, I'm seeing what it means to have your work uh, repackaged in place of a white person in front of it, I'm seeing what it looks like to have places that say, uh, sorry, we, we can't take you on right now, we're not interested, and then two months hire a new white packaged person. What I mean to say is I'm really seeing the caucasity of the art world quite far in front of me at the moment. And it's hard, because you feel like you've worked with certain Jews. And then what I think I do to get through them is remember that you just go back to your work, and just go back to where your work sits, and that your work will exist. My work, in fact, I can't speak about people's, my work exists whether or not there's two people watching it or a hundred people watching it, whether or not there's this deal with it or there's no deal with it, I was always making this work. And so for me, when you take away those standards of what I'm thinking are acceptance, like I almost think that the idea of inclusion goes off of the basis that I want to be in their party anyway. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. it's boring, no, no one can no. dance. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, majority of them can't dance. So, like, I, I think inclusion suggests that I want to always be involved with them. And sometimes it's like, actually, I want to pay rent. So, unfortunately, these people hold the gatekeeping to my rent. Uh, but they don't hold the gatekeeping to val validity. Mm -hmm. They don't hold the gatekeeping to my success. I choose what my success looks like. I choose what my validity looks like. And so I think shifting that has helped me because I think I got distracted. I was like, why is all these people recognizing this person when they're doing it? And I've done this, this, and this. And I was like, hold on, when I'm pointing over there, I'm ignoring the eight black queer people back from my council estate that send me a letter, a handwritten letter. They would never send a letter to fucking no one every month to tell me what they've liked about what I've tweeted this week. Do you know what I mean? And I mean, I'm going over there. That's sort of validity I need. So uh, I don't know if I really answered anything, but yeah. Thank you. Cool. Um, it's, it's, it's interesting. Um, I'm really touched by, by what you've all said and what you've all shared. So firstly, thank you for that. Um, I think as a, personally, as, as a queer working class person, I've always had this sort of chip on my shoulder that uh, I don't belong in, in this art world. And even sitting on this panel, I feel like I don't belong here. I had this voice in my head on the train that said, you're not smart enough, you're not clever enough, you don't deserve to be you know, in a room with these people. Um, how, how do we silence those voices and, how, and believe in the art that we're creating? Because I know the art that you're all creating is wonderful, but how do we tell ourselves that? Um, I don't think I'm the best person to answer this because I don't really find myself hearing those voices anymore. Mm. I'm kind of like, <laughs> I'm really fucking ace. <laughs> like, of course, yeah. obviously. I, I, I think part of that voice 
uh, changing is a form of protest, I think, and I think it's more of a kind of, it's kind of, the reason I don't hear those voices anymore is because I got very tired of hearing them, and I thought, well, I'll just change them and flip it around. Like, every time you silence a voice, you, you silence it by saying, no, you're fucking great, you just disagree. And you just, and if you know that you're a valid person in your own right, then you have, if you have the answer to the, that, that response, then you, you already think it. If you know that you, you know how to silence it, you know that you're not stupid, and you know that you are valid, and you know that you are creative and talented. If you know that yourself and you're well enough to say that you're not, then it, like that, it's, it's there already. And I think. Kind of what you were saying, like I don't. If the if, they're, if I'm going onto a panel where people are going to think what are they doing there, then I don't really care. Like, I I that I know that I'm here. I'm happy to be here, and um, I know exactly why I'm here. And I think that I'm not interested in. If, if that's how if that's how someone would feel if I was on this panel, then they shouldn't really be in the room. Yeah. So I think it's about, yeah, I don't want to be part of that party, so if I'm not clever enough to go, I'm not going to go. Um, I, I just think that actually, I mean, this is a really valid question, self-sabotage is the biggest enemy of creating art. I think that is, that is literally the worst thing that really can just destroy any potential that anyone might have. And I think, I always say this to anyone who, you know, who, who, talk, who I talk to about writing and wanting to start and stuff, it's literally, just do it. Literally, just do it. That doesn't mean that, doesn't mean that you can't be critical about your own work. You know, I'm cocky about my work because I really put myself through it as I'm creating it. So by the time I'm ready to give it out to my publisher or my agent or whatever, I know it's literally as good as it can be, you know. And I'm not interested in perfection in creating pieces of work. It has to be perfect for the time that I write. It's every book I've ever written, I think, that is the best I could have done at that particular moment. But the book I wrote 15 years ago isn't this book, you know? It's, you know, creating is a process. You know, I went to, I did my degree at Goldsmiths. I did a film degree. And one of the things that I really took away from that experience was the um, discipline of not being so precious, but actually just creating work. Whether it works, whether it fails, you learn from all of it. And I treat books and treat writing pretty much as, you know, as, um, as um, creating, you know, paintings, you know, that I just want to stack up against the wall. And some things will work and some things won't work. But you, you can't judge how things will work compared to everything else you've done. If you don't do it, you literally have to sort of free yourself from that kind of, um, self-doubt because you'll have enough doubt as you're creating the work we shouldn't let a notion of self-sabotage or not be good enough that, um, that anyone else creating work to be the thing that holds you back yeah. that's kind of nice um, yeah can i ask something yeah. um i think it's been really unconventional i changed the world <laughs> um i just on that note of kind of they can't care too much about if it's going to be good or not the best lesson I ever had as a creative person was that everything you ever do is going to be a failure. Yeah, yeah. totally. And like even what you were saying, but I'm not sure if my work has touched on the things that I want it to touch on. It hasn't, and it never will because otherwise it'll just stop. True, yeah. yeah. So everything should be a failure and everything should be always trying to get better. It should always be completely comfortable with the fact that it's going to be shit. It might be shit. Mm. Yeah. And that's okay because if it's shit, then it means to do it again. Yeah. And that, I think, is the best thing I have taught, said to me, and um, it's the best thing that will, that keeps you, that spurs you on when you're feeling like you should stop, not bother. It's like, if it's a failure, then why don't I just do it anyway? Yeah, exactly. I've I seen a tweet, actually, it was saying that the best place to be is, like, suspended between humility, like, between thinking that you suck and thinking that you're fine because like mm. have you seen what's out there like they're really publishing some crap do you know what I mean? <laughs> like, you're fucking great like, I, like, no, but that, like that why not me most, absolutely do you know what that mean? should be the most like why venture. not why yeah. not me like no I, yeah. I maybe I suck do you know what I mean that's none of my business necessarily <laughs> like but also, but also so, but also the other thing we should be aware of and not beat ourselves up is that 
you know, in our, you know, in every creative practice generally, white mediocrity, white cis mediocrity goes a long way. Yeah. So, yeah. So, why because, you know, just make the thing. Yeah. And, you know. <laughs> yeah, no, that, that was it. Like, yeah, I just, I feel like I'm well practiced. And the, the question of how to be, be more comfortable, it is just practice, do you know what I mean? Because, like, I remember being a teenager and, like, feelings, you know what I mean, like a teenager feels, and <laughs> terrified, and all, I just decided one day that when I got that feeling of, of the pressing on your chest when you want to say something but you're, but you're scared to say it, that just to say it and see what occurs, and sometimes it was absolute nonsense, but ultimately nothing go, goes wrong that badly, do you know what I mean, just by you being yourself, like it's, it's, it, it, it is like practice, you got to get stronger, stronger at it. But you gotta back yourself as well, and you gotta think, fuck these people. You gotta wake up in the morning, look in the mirror, and say three times, fuck these people. Because, <laughs> because like, who says when I, I went to Oxford, yeah, and I managed to keep my Scouts accent, and I did that by being a prick to everyone I met. Because, I, like, on my first day, I, I said two awful things that I'm so proud of. Like, one of them, I, I spoke to this guy who literally looks and sounds like Boris Johnson. Um, he, it was at the meet, meet your year, like meet and greet thing. And I was like, um, he was like, oh, how's it going? And I was like, I'm fucking sick of hearing Southern accents, to be honest with you. <laughs> you all, all sound like you're on the BBC. Like, you just gotta flip the framework. Like, who says that the good thing is what they say is the good thing? Like, maybe I know what the good thing is. And like, I don't need to. Like, you don't need to believe me, do you know what I mean? Like, I know. Yeah. Like, swear. And maybe I'm wrong, but it's my right to be wrong. And it's the world according to me. Because because I can't be someone else. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, um, yeah, I think... Uh, I really resonate with what you were saying a lot. Uh, because I think I still go through it. And I was trying to think of an answer, and I realised that like, you don't, maybe in my experience, I'm not, uh, the same technique doesn't work every time. I was thinking about when um, I was like 20, I was 21 when I got off with the residency at the tape. And uh, I remember it one for lots of reasons. One, because um, I was still working in the clubs at the time and stuff like that. But also, I don't I didn't have a university degree or anything like that. And I remember that I was, I didn't need to go to the interview. I applied on a whim because uh, someone recommended me. You had, it was one of those where you, uh, oh, this fuck, this is on video. <laughs> <laughs> and I've named the gallery. Anyway, I'm fucking, <laughs> all right, residency finished, actually. Uh, but um, uh, it was one of those elitist, stupid things where you could only be uh, recommended for the job. You couldn't apply, it wasn't an open application for the residency. So when it came through that I'd been recommended for it, I was like, what the fuck? And uh, the person was kind enough to send me it, because I probably wouldn't put it in my spam folder anywhere. I was like, a residency at the tape, fuck off, I'm like hosting drag shows, which actually, obviously, that is now to say that I think they're the very people that should have a residency in tapes. But at the time, I had that voice in my head, right? Mm -hmm. Of not being good enough, not da 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 da. And then the person sent me an email saying, oh, I saw your show, this is why I've recommended you, it's not as intimidating as it feels. I was like, great for you to say middle class, Michelle, but I'm actually stressing out. Uh, so um, I wasn't going to go to the interview. Like, I really wasn't going to go. I thought there's no point because I'm not good enough. And it was so repetitive that uh, I didn't even get ready for the interview. And then the time had gone where, like, it got to the five minutes where if I didn't leave through the door now, I would be late and then I wouldn't go anyway because I'd be late and I just felt being late. So then I left, I was like, well, fuck it, I'm just gonna leave out the door and go and use that time to go. So I, I went to the interview in like, um, not really my pajamas because I'm always stylish, but like, uh, <laughs> like it wasn't my best look for what I would do for an interview. Like now, like I boss that, I, I create a visual story for my interviews. <laughs> uh, it wasn't my best look and I had my makeup on, all these things that I wouldn't, basically I left, just left the house. and. Um, my technique was, it's a really long story for not that good of a finish, but like, uh, sounds like a, anyway. Uh, a lot of um, my technique, and this really sounds silly, and this is actually can't believe it's gonna be on camera, but my technique was to lie. Um, I just actually lied to myself and then to them in order to get through. So I lied and said I was worth it for the job. 
And it wasn't like, it wasn't this make believe that I believed it. I genuinely didn't believe it, but I just was like, well, I'll just lie. <laughs> uh, what then happened was that the lie kind of continued into the room. And when they asked me how old I was, I said I was 28. Uh, but I was 21 at the time. Because <laughs> um, I thought that they wouldn't take me if I was 21. And it wasn't until they gave me the residency that we got to signing like the proper paperwork. So it's the first time I had to get like a UTR number, like UTI or UTR number or whatever. <laughs> but I had to get like all of that. And they were like, oh, you said you were birth. I was like, oh, well, I've got to tell you. But I lied my way in. But then I asked them, this is when I think that the idea about it all relies on us to get over imposter syndrome, like you said, doesn't work. Yeah. Because when they figured out I was lying, I said, oh, sorry, plot twist tape. I'm actually 21 at the time. And uh, they looked and they were like so annoyed. They're like, why did you? And I was like, be honest, if I said I was 21, would you have given me the job? And I won't say the answer because it's on camera and, you know, that would be like age discrimination. But they gave a face to suggest that maybe they wouldn't be giving me the job. So that then made me feel like, okay, actually, some of these things I'm thinking are wrong about myself. But some of them actually, like, it's not to say that I want to be in bed with my imposter syndrome. But I also do think that it comes from someone. Yeah. It comes from an experience of knowing what it's like to be, how people respond to you. Yeah. Whether that's because you're working class, whether that's because you're young, whether that's because you're whatever oh, something's happened before where people have said I'm less worthy because of this. Mm -hmm. In that case, it was my age. And I lied and I was right. They wouldn't give me the job. So my advice to you is to lie. <laughs> 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 um, I think we might have time for a couple of questions um, from you lovely lot, if anyone has anything you want to speak to our panellists or just a comment. Yes. I'm interested to know at Oxford what the other thing you were proud of <laughs> oh, the other thing I said. Oh, um, I said, someone said, are you going to, a, to the phone party tonight? And I said, the phone, party. the phone party. And I said, no. And they were like, oh, why not? And I was like, well, there's no one I want to meet at a phone party. <laughs> <laughs> so, and then there was like five of them. They were all like, we're going to the phone party. And I was like, <laughs> 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 And honestly, I did get to know them over the course of the years, and I was right. Yeah, um, I was wondering if uh, you guys, as artists, um, what do you think about gayness or queerness as a concept that's divorced from, say, a personal experience, because, like, as you were saying, there could be many, many people out there who just um, have nothing to relate to when it comes down to the LGBT community or experience, but when you're putting art out into the open world and it's there to be received by anybody, do you think there's anything that even, like, the straight, but like a straight person could look at from LGBT art and say, yeah, this concept is strong and makes sense and is worth pursuing. Um, so I'm just going to kind of re-ask the question to make sure I've got it. So are you saying that as a as queer artist, when you're making it and there's a straight person, for instance, who wouldn't have any personal experience that's shared, how they relate to it, is, is that what you mean? Not necessarily relating to it, but do you think that there's... Seeing it valid, as valid kind of stuff. Or just anything that exists um, within that presentation of gayness that is, um, yeah, good or strong or interesting or just anything like that. Oh, okay. Well, yeah, because they've been stealing from the culture for years, so they must be liking something. Um, you know, my answer to that would be like, absolutely, queerness has been completely creating culture, aesthetic, uh, music, beats, house music, what they dance to, what they wear, the language they use, the TV they use, all of their inspirations, the makeup they wear. Fuck, like it's as if contouring just suddenly existed in the last like 10 years. <laughs> So, so I would say they're already doing that. Whether or not we get the credit for what they're doing and finding inspiration from, no. But I also believe that queer people are told cis men that they weren't allowed to have emotions. So that's another thing as well. Like I think that, I think that, like throughout history, queerness has been 
always at the forefront. And to be specific, one of an aesthetic, really queer blackness as well has been at the real forefront for so many vanguards of culture. And it's whether or not, and I think we're at a moment now, I say this as if I've known other moments, I'm literally 10, but uh, <laughs> uh, from looking and reading, actually, fuck it, I, I read a lot about queer history for this very reason, because I feel like as an artist putting out queer work, I want to know where my work sits in a lineage of other work. Mm. I want to know what work it's in conversation with, what work it's saying fuck off to, who I'm doing before, because otherwise they'll do this thing where they try and pretend like I'm the first to do something, mm-hmm. and that smells of bullshit and a historic, a, a historicity, or whatever that word is, I don't know, that isn't the fucking word, but, um, so, so I'm, I'm researching it, and I think just with, from what I've researched, or feeling, or the feeling I'm getting, is that we're in this moment now where queerness is having a surge in a certain type of way. Yeah. And then I think what happens when things surge is we think that this surge hasn't happened before or wasn't constantly influencing in loads of other ways. Mm. I just think now that there's a different way of documenting it. But straight people are always fucking going to us for everything, whether they're out about it or not, a lot, in lots of different ways, <laughs> both personal and political. Uh, but I also think one last thing on it is that not just from our art, but from our politics, there's a lot that queerness can constantly be related to. I think we are telling straight culture when they decide to listen, which as we know, is not often. But when they do decide to listen, I think queerness is telling lots of people about other ways of being emotionally, of consent, about bodily autonomy, about choosing how we want to live and deciding. I think queerness is doing lots and, uh, the few straight men that have been able to withstand the, the many obstacles I put to still be in my life, uh, they tell you that I think they're better for it because they've met me and my queer friends. Yeah, I just wanted to add a small other angle to that as well, which is that like I'll sit for hours and read or watch stories about straight white men, and I don't feel like um, it's not interesting to me or I can't relate to the their feelings or whatever because like I don't share their identity like there's there's something universal in every individual story and there's also something unique and uh, unrelatable to anything else like but both of those things are true like every every person every story is is both completely human and it contains all of history and, and humanity within it but it's also its own pinpoint within that and um, which can't be replicated elsewhere and like it, that's kind of what I was saying earlier as well. It's like, I, for me, I'll, I'll feel like we've arrived or whatever if there comes a point where a story about me could be considered universal or a story about another queer person could be considered universal because the particular conditions of um, my categorization are no longer seen as like the, the fundamental identifying thing about something that I've written or whatever. Yeah, well, just pretty much to add to what you were saying, I think what still exists is a um, cishet prism of how you consume art. So I think people like that queer art exists, but it needs to be through their own prism, and it needs to be explained through their prism. So, for example, with my book, I've had a really ex- interesting experience with my book since it came out in the summer, which is, it's, it's unapologetically queer and there is no entry point for it. So it's not a primer about voguing, it's not there to explain anything to you, there's no glossary. So there's certain regions who can't get their head around it. They don't understand the language, they don't understand where the voices come from, they don't understand the history, and they find it alienating. Equally, you have... Um, so people who understand that it's a book about family, it's a book about chosen family, it's a book about coming of age, it's a book about protests, it's a political book about, um, you know, communities, trauma and visibility. So pretty much what you're saying, I'm very interested in when we get to a point where you can actually, people of any kind can basically dissect a piece of art on its own terms without the prism and without the arrogance of expecting any minority art to be created through an external prism. Um, just to kind of follow up, I think uh, you're just really great. 
Um, I think that it's going from what Niven was saying of the nature of performance and queer people making art in these spaces. Those spaces are being now, the gatekeepers of those spaces are the white cis straight men. And, um, oh, women actually, they're great too. Ugh. And, um, and then it's the fact that the nature of performance and art in itself has come from the queer community and queer people. And so it's this idea of, it's very hard not to feel like a dancing monkey on stage. Yeah. Mm. Very hard. And the nature of even, I don't think queer people really care about having a stage or not, or tech, or like a microphone, or any of these things, because it's not about that for us. And it's just about connection and sharing. We don't care about these technicalities that make something more valid for some reason. And I think that because we're constantly being viewed from that scope and it's being put in that template, the nature of a queer person doing art in itself is, ooh, look at that. And I don't care about a script. I don't care about knowing all my lines or anything like that. And so I think there's, like with Travis's show, for instance, it's still in this box of not queer, even though it's queer and it's art and it's beautiful, it's made completely by you, you still have to go to these theatres and ask them to put it there. Mm. Like it's it's just, ugh. Yeah. But it's something that is happening. You have to kind of get into the system in order to fuck it. Mm. And I think we need to, we're getting better at using loop, basically. <laughs> <laughs> I think, this goes back to what I was saying, I think the most important thing is to, is to do the work that is important to you outside of what opportunities may arise or what people may ask of you just because the platform exists. So, you know, in writing, for example, I'm really, really keen to see people of colour write nature books. I want to see more poetry. I want to see fiction that isn't about identity but is about a beekeeper. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. It's really, art should really come from your own obsessions and preoccupations, <coughs> not from external, um, you know, those platforms are interesting. They're great um, ways to sort of leapfrog and get some attention if, if it chimes in with what your work is. But, you know, I talk to a lot of writers who feel that they have to write, you know, I'm coming from, you know, just talking about writing and fiction, for example, but I speak to a lot of writers who feel, I need to write a story about identity because that's the only way a publisher or a magazine is going to be interested in me. It's like, it's not. You need to write the thing that is 
is really on your mind, the, the idea that keeps you up at night. Because actually that's more important. And that's where the best of art is. Because you're right, as platforms exist, and the, the ubiquity and the, um, the quantity of all those platforms means that there is going to be some really terrible art. So it's really about your own standards of an artist, what will, what you will and won't do, I think. Mm. Um, I, I, work, I was at a sort of potato leader magazine, a local music magazine, for like a year, and there I tried to do diversity without like talking about it too much, but I definitely have also been guilty of platforming a range of... I mean, yeah, I was, because I'm definitely... <laughs> yeah, like we're all guilty, but also I, I think you can't beat yourself up too much because like, it's like, it's, it's more about trying to separate the creation process into like a bubble that's comfortable and unique and a, a, for you, and then understanding that then there's like a marketing process that is about the world and its its trappings. So like if you can separate those two things, you feel better and stuff, but I want to answer the other question you asked, which is like, what do I want from like institutions and, and people? And it's, it's to stop, like, giving it all up, do you know what I mean? And actually, like, listen to what people are telling you. Because I went to a, I went to a talk not that long ago. Um, the, it was the director of uh, one of the big theatres in Liverpool talking about um, access and diversity. And she was like, yeah, like, you know, we, we put on shows and we think, like, POC are going to like, and then they just don't come. And it's like, but did you ask anybody who, what, who wasn't? why it's like like what do you think we just like stuff that's about like being that like being poc or whatever like no like that's so boring to talk about that's just like the the grim realities of your day to day like like ask me what i like and i'll tell you in it do you know what i mean like actually give up the framework mm. to someone else don't don't create these like even like agenda things like in mu the music scene in Liverpool is proper bad for that like oh an all, all girl fronted band night like that sucks like a bad one of them's good the other two that I don't care about like it, it would be more relevant to categorise those people in terms of like the genre of music that they're producing or whatever like, like it, it comes from actually not wanting to give people actual space and actually giving up your own right to decide and control everything like just stop being such a control freak and shut up and ask questions and then do what people are asking for and the results will flow because you're really shooting yourself in the foot by being like i want to be more diverse and i'm definitely not racist and like look at me and i'm i'm honestly fine like it's not an accusation to say that you're racist like we're all racist like we, we've all absorbed the messages of this society like we're doing our best and doing your best is largely, largely an act of humility and silence. And I think like that's the direction I want to see institutions going towards is, is the silence. And that yeah. criticism is valid. Just because um, institutions, publishers, you know, you a there. <laughs> um, but just because, you know, institutions provide these things doesn't mean that they're not beyond transparency and criticism and, um, address in terms of how they improve that, mm -hmm. for sure. Yeah, critique is love, man. You just ignore someone if you didn't like them. It will not seem to be better. Do you want to go? Okay. Um, I just, of that with the institution kind of side of the question, it's, um, there was an art, an artist residency advertised at a women's <coughs> gallery. Um, We're all learning from my mistakes. <laughs> <laughs> and um, it was, I, purely for disabled, someone who identifies as disabled. And um, I looked into the venue that they used, where they, were, they were asking the artists to spend time in, and it was up, uh, I was like a spiral staircase. And then in the kitchen area, it was just, it was just the most inaccessible place I'd ever looked at. And they were asking for the disabled artist who had a physical disability specifically. And I just, and so I emailed them and I said, Do you realize that by not making this space accessible, you're actually putting someone in danger? For what good? Because you look good and you ticked your Arts Council box of diversity and inclusion. And I think um, one of the things that I agree that, yeah, it's tiring to hear all these artists organize it, arts organizations. Big and small, I'd like to say, um, talk the talk and then not do anything about it. Um, it's exhausting, but I think I spend a lot of my time 
uh, emailing and messaging and tweeting. I'm not very good at Twitter, I still don't get it. But, um, and doing a bit of a call out in an educational kind of tone. Um, because they aren't listening and they aren't actually doing anything about it. But um, all we have to do is just keep responding and not just going, oh, I'm not going to go and see that just because I'm a PMC, for instance. Um, and so then you just don't go. And it actually proves their point by going, theatres love saying, oh, PMC don't go to theatre. Yeah. It's like, well, that doesn't mean they don't like theatre. Yeah. Like, understand why people are in the room instead of the fact that they aren't. Yeah. Can, sorry, can I yeah, just... Yeah, no, go, go. Um, There was this poster I seen um, in Kazakh, I think, like, from a mad white little city, and it, it was saying, it was like, we welcome you! And then it was like, we want pe- we, we, we welcome people of all, di- all disabilities, all abilities, all genders, all races, um, and then I think at the end someone had handwritten, and all dogs as well. <laughs> and it was just like... Because it's like... That's what they're always, that's what the vibe is so often. Yeah. It's like, we welcome you. Like, I remember this girl at this party once was like, you know, I for one, because someone had said something racist to me, and I was like, telling her, and she was like, you know, like, I for one, I'm honored to have people such as yourself in our country. And I was like, oh. I am from, like, I am born probably in the same hospital as you. Like, can you please? Like, it's, it, it's, it, you gotta listen to yourself and say, does this sound like we welcome you? Or does it, you know what I mean? That, I think that's a question people should ask themselves. <laughs> um, I think about what you said a lot about your question. I think about it a lot. I think about it as someone that I think is also a product, well, not a product, but has sometimes has been a product of exactly what you've said, and someone that has maybe woken up to what was happening last year or whatever, and then with that tried to make some decisions with myself because I thought, well, I can't really, uh, uh, I can't focus on them too much because I can't control what they do at this moment, but I can control what I do. So I started doing this thing where if I would be invited to speak at something that looked like it was gonna be like that kind of vibe, which is hard to pinpoint, because I do think there's like nuance in when those events are done well, but like the kind of like, here you are, trans in this, trans in that, you know, like some of this, I say no to like 90% of the things I'm asked for, not because I'm like some work like savior person, but more because 90% of the things are just, I'm not qualified to speak about. Uh, but because there's trans in the world, they like send it through to me and it's quite wild. Uh, so I started doing this thing where like, okay, when they invite me, see if I can bring in three people that I think are sick eyes, uh, that maybe don't get positioned under this trans umbrella because for whatever reasons, whether that's shadism, whether that's uh, fashion, whether that's markability, whatever these things, they're not being seen as, as, as trans in this moment. And what was really depressing is the places never email back when you start doing that. Uh, they don't welcome the conversation that you're bringing. Unfortunately, what became really clear is what they were interested in was was this version, not this other version. Uh, and that really it, it sucks actually because then you you just don't do it and they pick the next person. But what it taught me was that uh, this dancing monkey kind of vibe of like how do we resist being that? I'm still figuring it out. I will say that all of the work I'm pitching at the moment, uh, the stuff that I've written for my next show. Uh, isn't about transness, and you'll be completely surprised how many people that loved and booked burgers do not want to book it, and are not interested in it, and are not interested in the pitch. Uh, maybe it's shit, but like, I actually don't think it is. <laughs> um, like, I'm, I'm actually not, I'm not, when it was interesting when you were talking about failure, because I found that really hard because I'm like the opposite. Like, I'm actually like maybe overly perfectionist about the work that I put out. I'm not saying that none of it's been shit, but like, but actually, no, saying that I don't think any of the work I've done is shit, because I probably wouldn't have put it out if it did, but some other people might have thought it was shit, whatever. But like, um, and it's sad, but I think there's a way that what I'm trying to do, because I think maybe I can talk about what institutions need to do, but I also, I'd rather look at what I can do. And I think it's about what work we put our energy into and the people we put our energy into as well. And I think that's when reading about other people's work and understanding the canon is like a responsibility. If you're going to be an artist that has been placed in these identity brackets, it's actually like ignorance to not research who else is sharing that work with you. And that's not just the people that are shared on Instagram or some art magazine, it's also the people that, whether or not you're directly knowing it or not, your aesthetic is coming from. I think there's also a thing of, for me, uh, requesting funding for things that don't have a particular output 
right? I think art is under capitalism too, and funding bodies that are normally white uh, also want an output from us. And what I'm trying to do now is fund stuff that is for black, queer, and trans people that doesn't have an output that they see. And it's hard to find the funding, but we're getting there. And for example, so next year I want, I'm organizing a thing called lounge sessions where one thing I missed out on in art school or not going to art school, I feel like I missed out on was crit sessions, like actual chances to feedback about each other's work and to get black and queer and trans people together and invite black and queer trans people to be paid to come and critique and feedback about each other's work. Because I feel like you're right, sometimes we go and see things that are black or queer and we're celebrated for being there. And what that does is actually devalue us as artists to say like, don't just celebrate me for being there, like, look at my work. What do you think of it? What are you responding to it? So um, that was a long way of saying that like, I think I'm guilty of it too. And I think that we have to change what our output is. And why does everything that particularly, I think, non-white people in the arts do have to end with a show? and have to end with something we can show them. Let's start demanding funding for rooms that they're actually not allowed in. <laughs> Wouldn't it be amazing if we said, give me money so that I can then lock the door and talk to these artists about what I want to talk to about their art? Because I also get afraid of critiquing bad trans art. Mm -hmm. I went to Edinburgh Fringe and like naturally I was getting thrown all the trans and queer and trans artists of colours work to go and see in the first week to tweet about. When I saw shit work, I was like, I don't think I'm allowed to say this is fucking shit. And I also didn't want to, because I didn't want the, the white people to see that I was saying this black person's work was boring as hell. So uh, fund us to have a separate room so I can shave them to their face in private. <laughs> <laughs> right, Travis. Um, we're very, very much out of time. Um, but thank you all so much uh, for coming, for joining in, um, and for being part of what I feel has been a really wonderful, affirming, um, positive conversation. Um, full of rage and joy and all of these conflicting emotions. So thank you all for that. Um, in a very sort of Jerry Springer, uh, American daytime TV show sort of way, maybe um, I'll invite the panel to sort of leave us with a final thought or a positive message or something like that, but maybe very quickly in one word or in a sentence, um, what you feel hopeful about or um, you know what you feel angry about or what you want to, what you want to, the audience to go forth and fuck up. <laughs> um, I think that my uh, final thing would be look around and find people who are doing what you're doing and get energy from that um, instead of looking at the systems that are really not nice to you. Um, it's because then you can work together and you can exist just in, in yourselves um, and not feel like you're existing underneath something. Um, so I would just like have a, the first thing I did when I realized I wanted to be a live artist was Google disabled live artists and I met one of the best friends in my life. And so it's about that, like look around and then everything else kind of starts feeling a bit easier. Um, I feel like I spoke a lot, I'll just say, uh, some artists that have been looking at this week that made me feel really badass, that maybe you want to look at too, uh, Zinzi Mino, Campbell X, and Jeremy Harris this week have been my three people that I've been looking at their work. And uh, it's not new work to me, but I've been re-looking at it, and I really would recommend looking at their work for another lens of black queerness and so many things beyond that too. So that was Zinzi Mino, Campbell X, and Jeremy Harris. Um, yeah. um, I like what Tommy said, what you said about finding people that do that are excited about the same things as you. I think that's important and also to do things that are for, um, feel meaningless. Do things that feel meaningless because um, create often I feel, I feel like the thing I've noticed so often, from especially doing the Lolita and that and like meeting loads of musicians and stuff, is like there's two types of artists. There's the ones that like still remember that they started doing it because it was fun and it was play, and those who have sort of gotten and like and, and have become a product. And like we flip between them, but like I think uh, for myself, the advice I try to give myself and try to follow is to play more and have it matter less and do dumb things that don't benefit me or anyone else, um, just for fun, because. That is where it all started, yeah. and 
it started when I when I didn't have anyone saying it was good. I just did it because I, I liked it and my mum liked it or something, you know what I mean? Like <laughs> finding one mate who really fucks with you and just back yourself through them. Um, I'd say be brave and make something amazing or make something terrible, but just do it. Fantastic. Uh, thank you to my panel. Thank you to Tina. Uh, thank you to all of you. Thank you.